Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Aspen Ridge Church. It's good to see you guys. Uh, welcome to all the folks at home who are watching us. That's awesome, too. Uh, I invite you guys to stand. We're going to sing to get rolling tonight. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. Oh, I'll find a way to praise you From the bottom of my broken heart Cause I think I'd rather strike a match Than curse the dark Yeah, I'll find a way to thank you Though the bitterness is real and hard Cause I'd rather take a chance on hope Than fall apart Oh, I don't think I'm ready to surrender to the dark, no. Oh, even if my daylight never dawns, even if my breakthrough never comes, even if I'll fight to bring you praise. Oh, even if my dreams fall to the ground, even if I'm lost, I'm no one found. I say hallelujah anyway. Oh, I hear a hymn of triumph in the wilderness of my lament. In the lowlands of the mountain tops, I won't forget all that goodness that you have shown me. The promises that you have kept There's better days on the horizon up ahead oh, Even if my daylight never dawns Even if my breakthrough never comes Even if I'll fight to bring you praise oh, Even if my dreams fall to the ground I'm lost, I know I'm found Even if my heart will somehow say circumstances, no matter what we're going through. God, we thank you for that. We thank you that you deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise.
Thank you for singing with us. You may be seated. Be baptized because um, I'm kind of stepping into a new chapter of my life. I'm going to go to college and be an adult, and I just want to walk into that having people know that um, I believe in Jesus and that I'm going to spread the word no matter what. Well, um, I've been here for a year and ever since I've wanted to uh, just take uh, the next step on this journey that, uh, that Christ has placed me on. Um, I've wanted to be I've kind of wanted to be baptized like my whole life, but I haven't really thought about it like seriously until about two months ago. And I just, I think that God is calling on me to have that be my next step in my faith. And I just want to make it public and show people that I am a follower of Jesus. Um, I'd been in church all my life, but I hadn't really like decided that I was like, that I wanted to follow God until I moved to Aspen Ridge Church. And I went to the youth group and I had gotten some teachings that I hadn't gotten in a while and that I hadn't gotten before. And it just made me realize that I do love God and that I want him to love me. Um, growing up, I actually knew a lot about Christianity and the Bible, but um, some relatives I had who I'm not connected to or close with anymore would use God as a weapon against me a lot. So I actually kind of grew up feeling like God hated me and that um, that I wasn't good enough and that I had to prove myself constantly and then it really impacted my self-esteem and stuff but towards middle school and high school I kind of got more mature and I started to realize that um, Jesus does love us and even when we fall short that he's there and that he doesn't hate us and that those words are just words from the enemy and the first time I placed my trust in Christ was 
I moved here and attended a church and I felt something that I believed that I could put my trust in Christ and that everything will be okay. Bible verse is Ecclesiastes 3.11, and it's, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. My favorite Bible verse is Proverbs 31.25, which reads, uh, She is clothed with strength and dignity and has no fear of the future. Because I, I feel like the Bible has like wonderful, like, commentary on what like a woman of God or just a woman in general like should be like or um, how valued we are and that verse just makes me happy inside because I'm like with God I can be this way and I can be a better version of myself and I feel like that Bible verse is like perfect for that. Well church work we're so excited about uh, all that God is doing in the lives of the individuals we just saw. So you saw the two ladies from the youth group who got baptized at camp just a couple of weeks ago, and we celebrate with them. And then we have Josh Dahan is getting baptized tomorrow morning. So even from here, now in this moment, we celebrate with him and all the good stuff that God has done in, in their lives and um, that God is alive and working in us, and we're so grateful. So let's stand and sing just one more song here. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you. Thank you. Let's sing it together. Oh, I don't want to miss the beauty of heaven all around me. Your power and your mercy the greatness of your love and I don't want to lose the wonder of being in your presence of knowing such a friendship to be with you my God everything I am I throw into I just want my life to ever be entwined with you, tethered to your heart. And I just want my soul to ever stand in awe of you, tethered to your heart. to your heart what more could I desire what greater thing to treasure I'm convinced there's nothing better than living in your love oh caught up in the wonder of being in your presence of knowing such a friendship to be with you my God in everything I am, oh God, I throw into your hands, and I just want my life to ever be entwined with you, tethered to your heart, and I just want. Time 
stand in awe of you. I tell it to your heart. And oh, I tell it to your heart. One more time. Oh, tell it to your heart. Lord, that's our desire to draw closer to you. And then we thank you. We can do that when we sing, when we turn to your scripture, when we pray to you. You are the God that is close to us. And we can draw closer and closer to you. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. We celebrate that, right, church? Amen. Amen. You know what? Before you have a seat this time, just take a minute. Will you turn to somebody and welcome them to church? Let's do that. You may be seated. I want to thank Pastor Lawrence and team, our sound and video support. We really, really appreciate all of you. I'm Pastor Jeff. It's a privilege to be here just about 14 years now at Aspen Ridge, and I enjoy it. I really con connect with you and appreciate you and love you dearly. Uh, if you received a worship folder coming in, there's a communication card, bottom right. We'd love to know that you were present. If you have any prayer request or any way we can serve you, we would like to follow up to that end. We have containers. We receive those communication cards as well as our tithes and our offerings. So, Father, may you speak and we, your servants, listen. Prepare us to hear your address that your clarion call would be clear and compelling. It would be invitational, transformative. Forgive us for the ways that we've had our own selfish agenda this week or even today. Prepare us now to hear from your agenda, Father, and from your word. And we'll trust you for that in Christ's name. Amen. We continue, friends, a series entitled The Authority of Christ. I invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 3. We will pick up in verse 5 and following. C.S. Lewis, a famous Christian leader in the 20th century, wrote a book entitled Mere Christianity. In his book, he states that the existence of moral standards in the world gives evidence for the existence of God. Said another way, common uniform law throughout human history calls for a lawgiver. And really throughout the history of human literature and human civilization, there's widespread agreement about what is not commendable behavior. Cowardice is nowhere commended in the annals of human history. Betrayal of one's family or one's tribe, or one's nation. That is never commended. In the last century, the Holocaust, the senseless extermination of six million Jews, it's widely and universally seen as a grievous wrong. So I want to look at the existence of moral standards and law this weekend. Now, most people know there are 10 commandments in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 20, God gave Moses on Mount Sinai ten commandments. But fewer know that there are actually two places in the New Testament where something analogous is going on and ten commandments are received. One of those places is in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus presents a sermon on the mount and he gives ten commandments. Com commandments, is that the right word? He gives 10 Beatitudes or 10 Promises or 10 Commandments. And you can look that up. His apostle in this passage in Colossians 3, 5 and following gives 10 New Testament commands that we will look at in our passage today. Now this passage will remind us of a universal lawgiver and the way he reveals his standards. 
These establish our need for the forgiveness and leadership in Jesus that's available by faith. And they remind us behaviors, it, they matter, including what behaviors to avoid. So we'll pick up this weekend in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and following. It says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, the Ten Commandments number the same that we have in this passage. There are ten Old Testament commandments in verses 5 and verses 8. We have ten New Testament commandments. There are two tablets in the Old Testament. There are two lists of five commandments in this passage. In the Old Testament, God says, you shall not. It's not unclear. In this passage, Paul says, put to death, verse 5, in the list that he will give. Then in verse 8, put them all away. And in verse 9, put off the old man. So these are not unclear. In the Old Testament, curses would come to disobedience. In this passage, in verse 6, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Both lists include idolatry, blasphemy, adultery, lies, and coveting. Now, there are differences also. There's no mention in the New Testament passage of carved images, murder, stealing, Sabbath-keeping, or honoring father and mother. However... In chapter 2 and verse 16, the apostle addressed Sabbath keeping. And in two weeks, chapter 3, verses 20 and following, it does mention honoring or obeying father and mother. So only three are left out in our passage this weekend, carved images, murder, and stealing. Well, let's look at the list of the first five the apostle says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And we have here our list of five, which includes sexual sins and greed. What do these mean? Well, sexual immorality is anything outside of God's design for intimacy between a husband and a wife in marriage. Impurity is any kind of moral corruption, a more general term that is often applied to sexual sins. And lust has to do with a burning desire to gratify one's own needs at the expense of someone else. There are three of these, back to back to back. God is not unclear. Sexual immorality impurity and passion or lust fall outside of his standards and his design for behavior among followers of Jesus. Now, our culture no longer simply permits these behaviors, but celebrates them and demands their approval. The LGBTQ plus is seeking recognition, standing, and approval for what the Bible describes as sexual sin. But instead of approval, believers are to put these to death. They are like poisonous weeds that choke out the good stuff or the good growth or grass that God intends to flourish. So... They, um, they are to be pulled out by the root. They are to be turned away from, and these are to be exposed to the light. Elsewhere in the New Testament, the apostle 
James tells us to confess our sins to one another. So if you're doing battle with these wrongdoings, I would encourage you to have a friend, a fellow pilgrim in Christ with whom you can talk about and speak about the temptations or the areas of failure or these areas in your life because exposing them to the light is a key way that God brings victory and freedom. Let me talk a little more about other gospel churches and how they're approaching these things. Other gospel churches for the purpose of evangelism have decided to be comparatively soft on this list of sins or these sexual sins. The idea is not to alienate someone from the claims of Christ straight away. A waiting and watching world hears a declaration that sexual sins are wrong and, and wants to tune things out or tune out Jesus Christ. What should we do about that? In my opinion, it's an opportunity to clarify what we believe, that it's possible to love someone and to show them respect and honor and dignity, even while disagreeing with their choices or their lifestyle or their convictions. We want to be upfront about it. This is not a bait and switch. Come to Christ and then change your behaviors. You're going to have to deal severely with these, not coddle them. Put these things to death. Jesus was full of grace and truth. Repentance is a concept consistently found in the Bible. And God's standards prepare people for the gospel. The whole idea is to see the many ways we fall short and then to run to Jesus, the one in whom, by faith, any and every one of us can find forgiveness and freedom. It wasn't long ago I was reading Eric Metaxas' book entitled Letter to the American Church, and he intends to speak with a prophetic voice to the American church today. He's comparing and contrasting Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a leader in the German church in the 1930s with the kind of issues that the American church, he believes, need to hear today. Here are a few sentences from page 84 by Eric Metaxas. He says, we pretend we would have spoken out for the Jews in Bonhoeffer's day. But are we speaking out today on issues that are no less important to God in our time? If not, we are deceiving ourselves. But God is not deceived. On what issues are we ourselves being silent and for what reasons? Very young children in schools are being fed pernicious ideas on the subject of sexuality, ideas with which their young minds are quite unable to cope and to which our own parents object. Older children are being so confused by sexual activists that they'd agree to have their bodies mutilated so they can never become the men and women God has created them to be. Are we really to keep silent about all these things? The Bible is not silent. We should not keep silent. What are your convictions on these things? How can you graciously own those convictions and speak into individuals and a waiting and watching world that needs to hear the clarity and the vision, the picture of a righteous and holy God that leads to the gospel message. We've looked at three, the first three of the ten. Let's look at number four and number five. We're still on verse five. It says, evil desire and covetousness. So covetousness is in general just desiring a house or a spouse or a vehicle or assets or things that belong to someone else and, and being fueled with desire for something that is not yours. Evil desire is similar to the English term greed. It has the idea that I really want that material thing. And materialism is running rampant in our culture today. There, there, are, are, there is so much wealth and so much of an accent on material goods and material things. This becomes a sin of our day and of the culture and of our age. 
In my mind, money is like a brick. It's something neutral. It may be used to build people and things, or it may be used to hurl at someone and tear someone down. Money itself is not the issue. It's the love of money that is the root of all sorts of evil. And I have found it may be if you find yourself in consumer debt, the reason is because there's greed at work in your life. Or if you're yearning and longing for what money only can provide, then maybe money is taking the affection that God intends for himself alone. In any case, this first list is rounded out with greed and covetousness, which is idolatry. Again, these may be good things. God makes everything good and yet it's perverted by human desires to place good things in the place that God alone is designed to have in our lives. Here it is, verse 6, an account of these. The wrath of God is coming. And in these you once walked when you were living in them, but now put them all away. So we shift from the first list of five to the second list of five. And another way I could put this in the preaching vernacular is we go from preaching to meddling here because we're moving from external behaviors in the first list now to heart affections and attitudes in the second list. You notice the sexual sins took the first three places in the first list of five. Now in the second list, we have anger and wrath and malice. Now this has to be nuanced because Jesus was angry, and we know he never sinned. What did he do? He flipped over the table of the money changers in the temple, and, and he was railing at misuse and, and, and idol worship in the temple. And so Jesus was angry. That means anger is not everywhere and always wrong. The Apostle Paul says, Be angry in Ephesians 4 and do not sin don't let the sin go down on your anger. But what the apostle is calling out here is not the righteous anger of Jesus. It's not the kind of anger that you deal with and you don't let the sun go down on your anger. This anger is the anger of man that does not achieve the righteousness of God. And there are two words that come right after it. So we have anger we have wrath, and we have malice. These are sins of the heart. You can't really legislate these sins out of existence. They're, they're really calling for a heart change. And that heart change recognizes, whatever the case, God, I understand that those, those times when my anger, my wrath, that malice that was in my heart, that's evidence of something that's deep in my heart. And those, what it defiles a person isn't what comes into his mouth, it's it what comes out of his mouth, because that's, that's an indication of what's really going on in his heart. In Colossians chapter 2, we looked at the gospel which is giving us a new circumcised heart. In chapter 2 and verse 11, in Jesus you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, namely the circumcision of the heart, putting off the body of the flesh, having been buried with Christ in baptism, raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. And verse 13, you were raised in your, from the dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses. That's the gospel. You realize, I can't earn it and deserve it. I have sins that must be forgiven. In fact, all of them need to be forgiven. And that happens through Jesus and simply by faith. It is through faith in verse 12 that these things are activated. And so the key ingredient is to see the anger, wrath, and malice are sins of the heart that must be healed and forgiven by the gospel. But on a practical level, how do you deal with anger? 
And it seems to me humility is the answer. James Taylor in the rule and exercises of holy living has this to say in a quote. Humility is the most excellent natural cure for anger in the world. For he that by daily considering his own infirmities makes the error of his neighbor or servant to be his own and remembers that he daily needs God's pardon and his brother's charity, that person will not be able to rage at the levities or misfortunes or indiscretions of another. Humility is the answer for the sin of anger, wrath, and malice. Then the last two, what we see as 9 and 10 are slander and obscene talk. I was reading not long ago a book by Jerry Bridges recommended in a small group called Impact Player. And uh, this is called Respectable Sins. There's a very interesting chapter entitled Sins of the Tongue where he gives attention to gossip. He defines gossip as the spreading of unfavorable information about someone else, even if that information is true. And then slander, making a false statement or misrepresentation about another person that defames or damages another person's reputation. And it seems to me when we come to the last two of this second list, the company of faith, the assembled people of God especially need to hear these warnings because these sins may be thought of as respectable sins or sins that we coddle or that we tolerate or that we allow for sometimes in the name of prayer requests or other spiritual garb or language that we place around them. The people of God need to hear this today. We look at the first list, we say, wow, that's dramatic and that's observable and that's heinous and that's wrong. And certainly the first list is wrong. But then we soft pedal the second list and we allow for anger, wrath, and malice. Or there's slander and abusive speech that may happen among God's people. Jerry Bridges says in Respectable Sins, what about conservative evangelical churches? The idea of sin in many instances has been deflected to those outside our circle who commit flagrant sins. And it's easy for us to condemn those obvious sins while virtually ignoring our own sin of gossip and pride and envy and bitterness and lust. I hope you take this to heart. Imagine I'm presenting a message series or a message on the Ten Commandments. Remember, Old Testament, thou shalt not. Imagine I give a message on number one. You shall have no other gods before me. Someone comes up to me and says, a simply divine sermon, pastor. Or then number two. Make no carved images. Someone says, you illustrated perfectly what God really looks like. Really? Well, I didn't intend to do that. Or number three, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. And someone says, as God is my judge, that's the best message you've ever given, pastor. Or number four, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And someone says, excellent bit of work, pastor. And uh, I won't go through all ten, but I'll just do number five. Honor your father and mother. Pastor, my dad really needed to hear that message today. You see how even in those comments, they're subtly undermining the very commandments that God projects right here in the, in the assembled people of God. The enemy is within. It's within the flesh. It's the world, the flesh, and the devil so that you and I stand in the need of prayer. We stand in the position of convicted criminal or felon, unrighteous wrongdoer in the presence of God. Any of these sins is enough to send any one of us to hell. It's true. So, what do we do about it? Verse 9, be honest with each other. Do not lie to one another. That calls for humility. When I'm honest, 
when you're honest with me, and when we're really transparent about what's going on, that breeds genuine humility. Seeing that you put off the old self or the old man that is no longer who you are, that's no longer who I am. There's an identity change that we mentioned in chapter 2. You put off the old man with its practices, and now you put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. If you know Jesus as Savior, you become a new creation. The old things are gone. The new things have come. And the Holy Spirit sets up residence in your life. He lives in you. I was going to say Lion King. He lives in me, all right? But, you know, he lives in us. He lives in any genuine follower of Jesus Christ. What the Holy Spirit is doing is he's in the process of renewing us in knowledge so that we would be conformed to the image of its creator, the image of Jesus Christ. There's a fancy word for this, sanctification. It essentially means being set apart to say, my standing before God comes in a moment by faith. It is positional. It is declarative. It is a declared righteousness. And then the process of becoming who I am. The process of growing in Christ's likeness. The process of being saved, where the Holy Spirit is making movements and changes and transformation in my life. That is what we sometimes call sanctification, this renewal in the knowledge after the image of its creator. And here, meaning in the new creation, here in the gospel, here among the people of God. There is not Greek and Jew. A Jew is a physical descendant of Abraham. A person living in the Greek world was something other than that, some other bloodlines flowing through that person's veins. Circumcised, member of the covenant people of God, uncircumcised outside the covenant, Barbarian appears not only to be a Greek, but further removed from culture and civilization. So someone really remote and out in left field when it comes to moral behavior or conduct. Then it says Scythian. This is very interesting to me. This was a reference to people who live north of the Black Sea, which is suggestive of a population that even lives there today as war is raging, north of the Black Sea, who truly had no manners and no sense of right and wrong. So that's the Scythians. Then you have slave, which were people of poverty or owned by someone else. And then you had free people who were of some economic standing. But you don't have those distinctions. Christ is all and in all. And so this new humanity is emphasized. It's inclusive of every nation and every class. If you're in Christ, these other distinctions don't go away, but they are transcended, and you are now defined in relationship to Jesus Christ. So people of different social standing, people of different skin color, people of different economic positions, these all become one in Jesus Christ. Here there is not prejudice. Here there is not racism. It appears in political circles our generation sees systemic racism and social injustice. It wants to solve the problem by legislation, perhaps racial quotas, perhaps financial reparations, by trying to resolve the problem with legislation. In my little mind, it serves to perpetuate the problem. The way the problem is truly and finally resolved is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the unity that we share, that Jesus Christ is Lord. We are defined in relationship to him. Men and women, sons and daughters of the king. So this passage says, put these things to death. Verse 9, put off the old self. Verse 5, put these things to death. Again in verse 8, put them all 
away. So is there some corner of your life that maybe one of these words really calls out? And you realize, oh my gosh, I've sort of been managing that or coddling that or allowing for that in my life, and I actually need to abandon that and completely put it to death and turn away from it. Maybe you prayerfully identify as we have a little time of reflection and prayer after this message, one of those things. But it's very interesting. Gary Richmond, a former zookeeper, in a book he wrote called View from the zoo, said this about raccoons. I thought this would be a nice way to pull this all together. Raccoons go through a glandular change at 24 months. They often attack their owners at about that age. Since a 30-pound raccoon can be equal to a 100-pound dog in a scrap, I felt compelled to mention the glandular change coming to a pet raccoon owned by a young friend, Julia. She said, it will be different for me. She had this pet named Bandit. She said, Bandit wouldn't hurt me, he just wouldn't. Three months later, Julie underwent plastic surgery for facial laceration sustained when her adult raccoon attacked her for no apparent reason. Bandit was released into the wild. Wrongdoing often comes dressed in adorable guise, and we play with it. We say, this will never happen to me. This will be different for me. But the results are predictable. So, Father, as we sit with this passage, we look to you that you would use this New Testament list of commands and that you would convict us in the power of the Spirit, first of all, for our need for a Savior. If there are any here who have never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, now is the time. Today is the day. The law shows us a need for the Savior. Father, others of us who have received Jesus as Savior but find ourselves convicted by the power of your word and the Holy Spirit who's renewing us within and calling us toward Jesus Christ in progressive ways. Forgive us, God. Would you take inventory of these ten? Would you open the door of our hearts and minds to assess and discern where we fall short, where we need to turn away from that, not coddle it, not entertain it, not manage it, but truly turn away from it. We trust you reveal that in Christ's name. Amen. Church, would you stand with us? Not the labors of my can fulfill thy law's commands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? And all for sin could not atone. O oh, thou must save and thou.
For the lyrics we can sing and believe if there's one thing I know it's how you love me Lord we thank you Lord for who you are amen to that right church man be blessed as you go as you hold on to those lyrics we'll see you next week have a good one